Well, good morning, and I hope it is a good morning. I hope that you're looking at today with hope and with optimism. We do choose each day how we will face it, and there are a range of good and bad options. The poorest way to face life, said President Teddy Roosevelt in 1910, is to face life with a sneer. The poorest way to face life is to face it with a sneer. You can picture the sneering face that he had in mind. Hostile, condescending eyes, brows scrunched up in a scowl, mouth contorted with the upper lip pulled out in kind of a snarl. If we're honest, we've probably made that face a couple of times. Maybe to our parents when we were teenagers, maybe to our siblings, maybe more recently than that. What concerned President Teddy Roosevelt was that a sneering cynicism would become the dominant way that we look at the world around us and that it would prevent us from acting in it. Roosevelt himself was known as a man of action. He, in his personal life and in his professional public life, he had overcome sickly childhood, that was plagued by asthma through exertion, through very serious effort and exercise. As police commissioner of New York at a dangerous time in that city's history, he would walk the streets at night to get a first-hand glimpse of the challenges that he faced. As president, he won the Nobel Peace Prize for brokering a treaty to end a war between Japan and Russia. Well, in 1910, Roosevelt gave a speech as a former president in Paris, reflecting on public life. And in it, he shared this concern about cynicism that he had witnessed along the way. Quote, a cynical habit of thought and speech, a readiness to criticize work which the critic himself never tries to perform, an intellectual aloofness which will not accept contact with life's realities. All these are marks not of superiority, but of weakness. Well, a century after that speech, I think we can safely say that cynicism is still a temptation for us. What is cynicism? Well, it's a sneering doubt that, will, that good will come of any of our efforts. It's a distrust towards others, a skepticism about their motives, their words, their actions. It shows up as a habit of fault-finding, as disillusionment, detachment, disdain, disengagement. Cynicism tempts us to turn away from the responsibility to be involved with the world around us particularly when it comes to the direction of our communities, our culture, our country. It makes us want to check out and keep at arm's length from any action. Cynicism criticizes hope as naive and clueless. It looks with contempt on the world around us when it doesn't live up to our expectations or to the ideals that it professes. In the Marvel comic universe, Cynicism is what almost pulls the Avengers apart. Cynicism about each other, about S.H.I.E.L.D., even about themselves. It's Han Solo mocking Luke Skywalker's earnest zeal for the cause of the Rebel Alliance when the outcome looks grim. Superhero villains like Joker and Green Goblin, these are thriving on cynicism. And in the Chronicles of Narnia, cynicism overtakes Edmund at several turns. You recognize it in the stories we see around us. Well, the fact of all this goes far beyond the individual cynic. Cynicism is a corrosive agent in the community, whether that's the family dinner table, a school, a city, or Iron Man rubbing off on Captain America. Cynicism, can't, cynicism can cause discontent and doubt in our ideals. It erodes our confidence in the principles and beliefs that we say we're committed to. The cynic's sneering voice rings in our ears, and it can make old truths empty as it mocks the individuals and the institutions who still hold to them. Well, what's wrong with cynicism? Practically speaking, it hurts our relationships. It typically comes out as mockery or cutting words that we use against each other. Cynicism says it's not worth it to reason together. It opts, to sh op it opts out, it shuts down conversation, and it doesn't just do that for itself, it does it for everybody who's in that conversation. It says it's not worth it to commit to others. And so it denies the opportunity to build authentically safe spaces 
instead of artificial ones, through relationships that provide stability that we need to be able to work toward resolution when the conflicts inevitably come. Cynicism also hurts us. When cynicism takes hold of us, it doesn't easily let go, and it can crowd out a spirit of hope and trust and leave us bitter towards the world around us. And what's more, it leaves problems unresolved. It does nothing to address the real issues that caused the cynicism in the first place. Well, theologically speaking, cynicism is wrong about human nature. It's an Oscar the Grouch kind of outlook on everybody around us. We see them negatively and it clouds our entire perspective on them, causing us to forget that people are made in the image of God and capable of doing good. The very first verse of the psalm speaks out against this scoffing cynicism. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. That's Psalm 1.1. Cynicism is also wrong about God's work in the world. Where the scoffer and the cynic want to give up on everyone, God has not done that. Come, let us reason together, says God to Israel in the first chapter of Isaiah. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Your, those, your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. These words appear in the midst of charges that God is bringing against Israel for not living up to the standards of the covenant that he has made with them. Their princes have become companions of thieves. They love bribes. They failed to bring justice to orphans and widows. The cynic would look at that situation and say, it's not worth my time. And yet God says, come, let us reason together to invite his covenant people who have wandered so far and so frequently from his path to return to him. Well, in view of such mercy from God, how much more should we be willing to engage those around us even when they disappoint us. Cynicism also shows a lack of trust. It's a matter of pride for us. We don't want to get duped or look dumb. And so taking on a style or mood of cynicism, almost like a piece of clothing, becomes a way that we avoid that. The bottom line is this, cynicism is sin. It bears false witness to the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. It makes us fail to love and to serve our neighbors, and it dodges our responsibility to engage the world around us. Well, today and tomorrow, I want to talk about that responsibility to engage the world around us, through, particularly through cultural and political involvement. And I want to speak about how cynicism threatens it and how hope is essential for it. First, what is our responsibility to engage? You'll remember from reading Genesis that the original job description for human beings comes at the end of chapter one in verse 28, and it boils down to this, to fill the earth with the reflection of God through the increase of humanity and to cultivate the natural world to greater ends. It's really quite amazing that in the perfection of the Garden of Eden, God set before Adam and Eve the goal of bringing about a more abundant perfection out of his already good creation. This is sometimes called the creation mandate or the cultural mandate. Marriage, work, worship, these were the building blocks of the creation order which the first couple was to expand. And what happened next, what happened next was that Satan tempted Adam and Eve with cynicism. Did God really say, he asks them? He convinced them not to take God at his word he persuaded them to mock God's authority by choosing contrary to what he had commanded, by opting out of God's plan. When Adam and Eve went along with this temptation of cynicism, it brought sin into the world in a way that tainted every dimension of the goodness of creation, from family to labor to human relationship with God. Everything that had been so promising in that initial charge that God had given to them. And yet, the charge was not defeated by cynicism. In Genesis 9, God restated the task of the cultural engagement to Noah after the flood. 
as he renewed humanity through that family line. But the head of a truly new humanity was yet to come in Christ. The life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ spelled the definitive defeat of Satan's cynicism. Christ's finished work of redemption becomes the hope of all who believe in him. In the wake of Christ's redemptive work, once again, the call to cultural engagement is repeated and renewed. This time, it takes the shape of that familiar passage of the Great Commission, with the call to go into all the world, to baptize, and to make disciples in the name of Jesus. And part of what it means to make disciples is to begin back in Genesis 1 with the cultural mandate, the call to engage and develop the world around us. That is a part of discipleship. We still do that through marriage and family and work and worship. And in our broken and sinful world, much of the shape this will take is to bring order out of chaos, figuring out how to pursue our lives here together without trampling on one another in our homes, our communities, our schools, our workplaces and in the political arena. Politics is one more way that we figure out how to order our lives together. Political awareness and involvement in these cultural issues of our times are among the ways that we obey the Genesis 1 command to engage the world around us. Now, I expect that some of you here today may be planning and and preparing and studying to have, to pursue a calling in politics. Maybe you're gonna run for office, you hope. In, and maybe you'll serve in a, a congressional office in Washington, D.C., or in a legislative office in your state capital. But I expect that most of you here are probably pursuing other callings, and you're not going to be on the front row of politics as a full-time politician or working full-time in public uh, policy. And yet, we are all citizens, if not of the United States, then of another country. All of you are or will soon be old enough to vote, And each of us has a responsibility as a result, a responsibility to seek the good of our neighbors and to love God as citizens and community members concerned about the culture around us. It's a matter of stewardship that begins with the conviction that citizenship is one of our callings. Now, to say that something is a calling is to confess that God has placed us in a situation for a purpose and that we are to glorify God and to serve our neighbors through it. It means we have responsibility for it. Neglecting it is not an option, at least not a neutral or good option. What we choose to do in response to a calling will have repercussions in our life and in the world around us. So the right response to a calling is good and wise stewardship. How do we do that? Well. I'm so glad the song this morning talked about hope and anchor because those are two of the main themes that I'm trying to get across here this morning. We need an anchor for engaging culture and politics that isn't merely drifting along as a cynic or a spectator or reacting to the last thing that was in the news. One place in scripture that can help us with this is 1 Peter in developing the sense of an anchoring. There are four things I wanna point out from this book related to the topic, and it's a wonderful book written to people, the early church under persecution, um, and yet so focused on hope. First, the Apostle Peter reminds us that we are sojourners and exiles in this world, and that our lives should testify to our identity as part of what he calls a holy nation in 1 Peter 2.9. Augustine, the early church father, called this the city of God. Peter and Augustine are referring to the body of Christ, to the church made up of all believers throughout history. This identity in Christ means earthly politics, cultural engagement will never be ultimate. And yet, second, at the same time, this transcendent identity does not justify a dismissive attitude toward government. In fact, just a few verses later, Peter gives us one of the clearest statements in scripture of respect and the need for us to respect God-given authority of government. This is 1 Peter 2, 13 to 16. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. 
Live as free, and live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Well, in God's good providence, in our day, he has made us citizens of a self-governing society. So part of what it means to respect political authority in our context here and now is to recognize that we participate in that authority. We have political responsibility of our own, and we need to use it well. What not to do is to become a passive spectator or an active cynic. The spectator treats politics like a horse race, watching it go by with no sense of involvement or participation. The cynic associates politics with never-ending squabbling and says, it's not worth my engaging. Well, our vision needs to be much larger if it's going to be based on scripture. And its hallmark should be hope. That brings us to a third point from 1 Peter. It's a book that regularly reminds its readers that despite their difficult circumstances under persecution, they have reason for hope. Now, even as he writes to spur them on to hope, Peter is not suggesting that the persecuted church of his day put on rose-colored glasses and try to see the world a little brighter than it is around them in reality. No, he wanted his readers to look at the world as it really was, with all the challenges it would present to them and to their faith. And this realism is the fourth point I want to raise from this book. It's really interesting to see how closely Peter connects the ideas of hope and being realistic, or as he says, sober-minded about the world around us. Here's, here's uh, 1 Peter 1, verse 13. This will be familiar to you. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Christ Jesus. Even as we hope, we need to be realistic about the way that the world is. Peter repeats this charge to be sober-minded in two other places in the book. And he links it each time to our readiness to respond well to the uncertainty of life on earth. So what does it mean for us to be sober-minded? Well, in, in part, it means that if we're going to live with self-control and obedience, we need to be realistic when we look in the mirror at ourselves and when we look out at the world around us. The book of Romans says that we need to have sober judgment about ourselves, not giving in to temptation to think about ourselves too highly, or by implication, the opposite extreme of thinking of ourselves too negatively. Instead, our self-image should be convinced that we have a dignity that cannot be erased because we are made in the image of God. And our self-image should also squarely face the fact that our sinful nature often causes us to act in ways that are not consistent with that dignity and fall far short of it. We need the grace of Christ in whom we find our ultimate identity to avoid these failures and to forgive us when we do not. We also need to be sober-minded about the world in which we live. The world is marred by sin, but it is also a place where God is at work. We strive for good, we face frustration, but good can be done. And our call is to faithful action for as long as life endures. Back to our verse in 1 Peter 1.13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here's what's really interesting to me. Hope actually helps to make us sober-minded. You've probably heard the old phrase about you're so heavenly-minded that you're no earthly good. Well, that's not how hope works. It's not just dreaming about a distant future and being distracted from the realities of life around us. You know, when artists developed the technique of perspective in the Renaissance, they would use a vanishing point on the horizon to create a sense of distance in the painting and depth. And it had this effect of making the images in the foreground more realistic and true to life. It's so commonplace now that we take it for granted. But that was a major development at that time. Well, hope does something similar for the way that we view the world that we live in. 
It helps us to see it more realistically. Hope keeps us from getting cynical about the shortcomings of this world at this moment, even as it sees something beyond the status quo and pulls us along toward that better horizon that puts all things in perspective. Well, in this spirit of hopeful realism, we can approach politics as an arena that brings together fallen human beings with transcendent longings that go beyond this world to sort out our lives together on this earth, to harmonize our diverse interests, and to build consensus on what's worth pursuing as a society. I'll have more to say about that as well as realism and hope tomorrow. In closing, let me make three brief observations about cynicism and why it's the wrong response to a right set of problems. Cynicism is a wrong response to a right set of problems that we need to react to. First, there are real and serious and deep, complex problems in the world that can lead us easily to disenchantment and disengagement. We can be incapacitated from action because the problems just loom so large. They're overwhelming, and cynicism becomes a protection for us. Well, the best cultural responses take the problems that we see around us that provoke cynicism at so many times, and these cultural responses cast them in their true light in a way that's also redemptive because we can see them for, we can see cynicism for what it truly is. Or these re cultural responses may even cast cynics in their true light, not for a laugh line, as we see so often in comics and other places today, but to show the self-defeating nature of the cynic. If you've read Flannery O'Connor short stories, this is a great example. She showed evil for what it was and wanted people to come to grips with it. She portrayed the cynicism in her characters that she wanted people to recognize. Well, to avoid being a cynic is not to be an idealist blind to problems around us. They are many and complicated and they require us to react hopefully. The second way that cynicism is a wrong response to a right identification of a problem is that it refuses to lean on the crutch of trite explanations about the challenges that face us in the world. We should want more than easy answers that are not true to reality, but that does not have to make us cynical. Instead, it should make us work harder, harder to understand and observe what's going on around us in the world, taking time to get to know the problems firsthand, and being caref careful enough and prayerful enough to respond wisely to them. Third, cynicism causes us to reflect on things that we might otherwise take for granted. So when we're tempted to be cynical, we should recognize this. What have I taken for granted? Just as when others question our faith, it makes us contemplate more deeply what and why we believe. So it is with foundational ideas about our life together in community. Cynicism asks questions. Let's answer those questions well. We should reflect on the things that we've always assumed and answer, give a reason for the hope that we have, as scripture says. Well, as I close here today, I want to read the end of the quote from that Teddy Roosevelt speech in 1910. It's, it's called The Man in the Arena, and this will be familiar to many of you. Here's the quote. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. May we be people of hopeful action. Let's pray. Lord God, 
Thank you for this place of worship. Thank you uh, for a campus that cultivates a spirit of hopeful action. And Lord, we ask that these would be days of reflection on how we uh, can bring a face of hope and optimism because of our hope in you to the world around us as we engage to address problems that uh, make others suffer, make us suffer, uh, make us weep with those who weep. Lord, give us wisdom as to how to respond in our spheres of influence at this time in this day. And we ask for your provision through Jesus Christ toward that end. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Have a good day.